Welcome to the Farm Bits podcast. Farm Bits is proudly produced by the Nebraska Digital Agriculture team and hosted by students at the University of Nebraska. The Farm Bits podcast comes to each week to discuss the trends, the realities, and the values of digital agriculture. Through interviews with experts, producers, and innovators from across the agriculture industry, we hope that you step away from each episode with new practical knowledge of digital agriculture technology. Hello, Farm Beats followers, and welcome to another episode of the Farm Beats podcast. I'm Natasha Almizu. And I'm Emily Hansen, and we're glad to have you with us as we continue our discussion on specialty crop research with Dr. Jose Lemmy from Southern Illinois University. Dr. Lemmy conducts research with cannabis biology and cultivation systems. With that, let's jump into this episode with Jose and learn more about cannabis research. All right, yeah. So I, I'm originally from Brazil, and I grew up in a small town called Uraí. And Uraí means sunset land in Japanese. As it, we talk, Nata, Natasha might be facing it. People might not believe that she's from Brazil, you know, having like a Japanese last name. But yeah, a lot of people don't really know that after the Second World War, a lot of Japanese people moved from Japan to southern Brazil. So my family has a, a, a farm in southern Brazil. So I, I have, you know, this farming roots. It's, you know, in my life since my, you know, childhood. And in the 80s and 90s, they... They moved to central Brazil to explore the uh, cheaper and flat agricultural areas in the, the, the call it new frontier back then. And so the agronomic engineering major was like a natural path for me. So I graduated from uh, uh, Londrina State University. Uh, and then uh, I guess as many of you also fa faced uh, I, I, I graduated and I, I was kind of tired of my broke life as an undergrad. So I want to work, you know, I started working as soon as possible. So I worked for Cargill a couple of years and then I took my um, um, uh, a break um, to, to, to had, had a, have a um, short-term scholar uh, experience at Oklahoma State University. So, and there was pretty much like an aha moment. I decided that industry wasn't a good fit for me. So then I decided to uh, apply for universities, for grad school in America. So in 2014, I got accepted at Auburn University to work with precision agriculture under Dr. Brenda Ortiz lab. And into, then I graduated and I started, you know, I, I went straight to my PhD at Virginia Tech, working with plant nutrition uh, under Dr. Wade Thomason, Thomason Lab. And currently, I'm working as assistant professor at SIU. Um, I'm, uh, my position is a joint position in the School of Forestry and Horticulture and School of Biological Science. And in my lab is the Cannabis Biology and Cultivation Lab. a very interesting background. So can you go into a little bit of detail about what areas your research covers and why you think it's important to conduct that research? So yeah, in the, the cannabis biology and cultivation systems lab, we focus in the areas as, you know, uh, control environment, agriculture, uh, plant secondary metabolites, uh, nutritional and pharmaceutical uh, biology, and growing practice in, in, in general. And our team is working on the development of techniques to maximize um, cannabinoids and non-cannabinoids like terpenes and flavonoids, secondary metabolites in general, uh, fiber and grain, productivity and quality via physiological, biochemical, and agricultural um, approaches. Oh, this is nice. Yeah, and can you tell us a little bit more so what motivated you to work with cannabis production? Um, well, I guess if, if you, you, you are motivated about science in general, the cannabis field, it's an awesome place to be because 
there is this, I would say, maybe 80 years gap, like knowledge gap, scientific knowledge gap, because uh, for more than 80 years, it's cannabis, it's illegal. So to work with this plant, to study this plant, uh, it's, it's literally prohibited. So my motivation would be, is, is just, you know, science, you know, it's, we need to catch up. There is so much to be learned, learn about this plant. And so far, of course, things are developing qu pretty quickly, but so far we have a lot of empirical data because even though this plant is, was illegal, people are still growing it somehow, you know, you know, hidden places, basements, and, you know, um, so I, I guess now it's time to kind of uh, create more information based on science, you know, and, and even test all this empirical data that we have so far, because it's still very important, you know, it's still, uh, people were, you know, they, they have experience with this plant and this empirical information, it's coming from some, uh, I would say, uh, visual differences or some, you know, experience in general. So we, it, we should value this in, uh, empirical uh, experience and but then validate that based on science. So I guess that's the biggest motivation. You know, it's just if you like science, the cannabis field is an awesome place to be because we have a lot, lots to expl explore. Can you go into some details about like the different terms with cannabis? Oh, great. Yeah. So, yeah, that's something that, you know, I'm facing um, a lot of people with some, I mean, I, I'm seeing a lot of misinformation uh, out there. So cannabis is the genus of the cannabis sativa plant. So cannabis is g the genus of the plant and sativa is the species. So I don't want to go through the species thing because it's a rabbit hole. Like some people say that uh, ruderalis is a different species. Some people say that it's not. In my opinion, it's just one species, sativa. Um, but you know, it's still science is still developing, and but G, the the term cannabis uh, under the 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 term uh, the umbrella of cannabis it's the the plants with high THC or high cannabinoid plants and plants that are used for fiber and and grain production. So when you use the term cannabis only for high THC plants, you're disregarding the scientific terminology that, you know, it's being applied for this plant. So, so industrial hemp was a way to kind of cat categorize plants uh, with uh, uh, THC levels under 0.3%. Um, but, but again, the uh, uh, it's when you say most of that's why I, I prefer to use THC cannabis, CBD cannabis, fiber cannabis, um, grain cannabis because it's we're still using the term in a scientific proper way, um, but and then you still in being more specific about what is the purpose of the production you're 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 talking about. Yeah, this is really interesting to know about this, you know, like terminologies for cannabis because who is not from this field is a little bit like complicated to understand those things. Yeah, yeah, and it's actually happening all, all the time. So uh, um, the term marijuana can be, you know, considered uh, racist, and and, and the ter term marijuana is uh, is very attached to high THC plants, but to use Cannabis only for high THC plant is erroneous. Mm -hmm. Okay, and can you explain some uh, the uses of for grain hemp? Uh, you're talking about only grain. Yes. Okay, grain. Uh, so you, I mean, there are many uses. So in general, the cannabis uh, plant 
can be the whole plant can be utilized in somehow. So the stalk, the leaves, the flowers, obviously, which is the you know where you extract the can most of the cannabinoid, but for the grain um, uh, or seeds. So actually, um, it's not like uh, hemp or industrial hemp or cannabis doesn't produce uh, seeds. It's actually the the right term for that is akin. So, uh, but you know, the hemp grain is very is a very very popular term. But it's it, scientifically it's an akin. So, uh, so you can use uh, the grains for for food, for uh, for energy, biodiesel. You know, you can make uh, biodiesel from uh, hemp seeds, um, uh, oil for food as well. But the oil. As it has like a very uh, low smoke point, the the oil is not very good for, like for like frying things. It's used more like a like a olive oil, uh, pretty much. Um, hemp grain is also used for cosmetics. You know, I guess you're guys seeing like you go to Target and there is like an entire section for hemp products. And most of I mean some some products are made by you know stalks and other parts of the plant. But many products are made from um, seeds or grains. Um, yeah, I guess in general, yeah, uh, that's are the use for for hemp seeds or cannabis seeds or akin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't know it could be used for biodiesel. That's kind of cool. Um, so, how versatile is like the fiber? uh cannabis and what kind of products can be made with that okay um yeah so the fiber hemp or 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 some are or in in many places they are using it as like a dual purpose which is you you harvest the grain and then you also use the the biomass the rest of the plant for fiber or or um to build like, for like construction parts. So we can make uh, like a, a, a construction part called a hempcrete. Uh, it's also, you can create a very, like a great isolate materials, like for sound. I, I mean, something that you guys can use there, you know, in this, the pot your studio, because it's a, hemp is a very good, um, can make a very good material to isolate sound and temperature. And, uh, and it it doesn't catch fire easily as other uh, isolate material isolation materials made from like petroleum. Uh, you can make you no know, animal bed. You can make paper, and you can make dashboard like cars dashboard. Uh, and you know something that is growing uh, significantly in, in America is the textile industry, because uh, I'm seeing you know companies as like Patagonia that, you know, making like uh, deals with farmers uh, because they need, you know, the, 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 the biomass the, to, to, to create this specific, I, I would say that is, it's still like a niche product, but this like clothes and um, made by, you know, uh, hemp fiber. Oh, nice, very interesting. I didn't know how many things we could do with those things. <laughs> I didn't know either. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You you can use the the whole plant pretty much. Mm -hmm. This is cool. So, just that now going a little bit more about your the research that you are, you are doing. So, can you tell us how the plant physiology can help with the plant productivity? So, how you use the plant physiology? Um, well. I guess, I mean, let's talk about the, the production of secondary metabolites, like your product, uh, cannabinoid product, cannabinoid and non-cannabinoid production, like terpenes and flavonoids. So I think plant physiology is a very good approach or, or tool when you're producing secondary metabolites uh, because uh, cannabis is a very responsive plant when you're exposed the plant to like, like stress, for example, um, let's say one of my, the research that I'm conducting, uh, super cropping. We are testing super cropping or high intense training on uh, on on cannabis. 
do, do you know what is super cropping or high intense training? Do, do you guys know? Not really. Mm -hmm. no. Okay. No. So, but basically, it's a, just a mechanical manipulation of the stems, like the branches. Okay. You, in easy words, you pretty much break all the branches of the plant. And obviously, you try to keep the, the cortex and the, the vascular uh, bundle of the plant intact because you don't want the, the, the pathogens to be uh, um, attacking the plant. But so you pretty much break all the, 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 the branches and these mechanical stress in theory, because again, empirical knowledge that you're, you know, seeing from people that are growing uh, cannabis during the, you know, all these years, but without any, having any valid, scientific validation, it, this is stress, mechanical stress would increase plant secondary metabolites. So that's why this is one of the study that we're conducting because we want to see that this, this mechanical stress or this high intense training will increase in fact the 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 production of cannabinoids and and terpenes and and and, and flavonoids in general so this is one good example of how uh, plant physiology can help us uh, with you know increased productivity. I mean, in this case, it would be productivity of secondary metabolites. And this can be seen as, for example, protection from the plant to external, um, for example, pests or disease. When the plant. I mean, good question. I guess you're not intending to ask like a philosophical question, but it's <laughs> it's let okay. Let me go there. Like, because the thing is. Um, secondary metabolites are usually uh, produced by the plant or in many cases are produced of, by the plant for protection, for like as a defense mechanism in most of the plants. But so far, there is not um, like very solid agreement or uh, very, uh, a lot of uh, scientific papers proving that the cannabinoid production is increased when the plants are under attack or like a like as a defense mechanism so we do have a lot of theories because you know most of the plants they produce this sec secondary metabolite like alkaloids you know flavonoids to to be to as a protection mechanism but for cannabis specifically we still need more information to I would say to prove that there the plants are producing cannabinoids as a defense mechanism. Then the philosoph philosophical question is: so if let's say if if it's, these plants are not producing these cannabinoids as a defense mechanism, like why why these plants are producing, let's say, 30%, 35% of their biomass to produce like a compound that is not for a like as a for a defense mechanism is it only for human use you know is only for like the you know the, the because you know the the human beings are having this interaction with the cannabis plant for you know many 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 years so is this is this plant just creating for you know human consumption so that's why i'm saying that it can be a philosophical question but again that's why we are you know so, uh, the, there are so much to be explored in this cannabis fi uh, field in general. Okay. Yeah, I'm asking this because that is one um, professor at entomology and he works with, you know, the plant response against aphids. So it, I could see some similarities in this time. Uh, okay. Yes. So, um, I, I think I will go for this, okay. this yeah. question here. Yeah, so can you tell us what kind of resources are available to pro to a producer working with ind industrial hemp in terms of fer fertilizer and chemical usage? Oh, I mean, I, that's actually a very good question because um, I guess obviously cannabis in a very unique or industrial hemp uh, is in a very, and, and again, just a disclaimer, when I'm talking and when I'm saying the term cannabis, I'm talking about 
industrial hemp, like the cannabis genus, you know, the, the plant, um, not only high THC plants. Uh, but um, but again, as I was saying, like I, I cannabis obviously is a very unique situation because I would say most of the 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 crops, you know, industry and academia, it's a it, there is like an equilibrium between you know the technologies that are being created in academia and industry, and there is a very good exchange uh, information information exchange between industry and uh, academia. But the cannabis um, in, in the cannabis field is pretty much like industry is here and cannabis, you know, in academia is right here. I, mean, I don't, I mean, for the, the listeners. So the, the cannabis industry is more advanced because they are being, they're working with cannabis for longer. And, 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 and academia is, I would say it's behind. Now we are trying to catch up. So uh, as we talk also I talk about the empirical information that is out there. So you have to be very you know, cautious about where you're searching your information because you can find a lot of empirical information out there, but not based on science. So, but lately, you know, many, you know, uh, universities are creating this, you know, industrial hemp programs. And then it's slowly, you know, they're, you know, you're creating reliable information to educate, you know, the, the growers uh, and the population in general. So I guess I would say reliable source would be, uh, you know, websites or, or, or so sources in general that are, you know, uh, dot edu pretty much, you know, that are, uh, in partnership or created by, you know, universities. Yeah, I know uh, UNL has a, I believe, hemp trial through weed science. And I helped with that for a summer and we did a lot of chemical application trials on industrial hemp. And that was kind of cool to see some of the results. No, yeah. And, and then, by the way, there are almost no agrochemicals approved for cannabis. So basically the the management is organic man management except fertilization because you can apply synthetic fertilizer but in terms of you know herbicides you know and, and fungicides are you know almost none and in canada there it's very it's actually very interesting because in cannabis they are releasing they are approving some uh, uh, agrochemicals for some specific cannabis cultivars you know it's like for example using it as a comparison you it's like in canada they're they're um, certifying some agrochemicals for one specific cultivar cultivar of like corn for example like the, the decalb 2631 so you can apply that agrochemical only in that specific cultivar so and they're doing that for cannabis so but i guess it's a slow process slowly more agrochemicals will be approved or certified for for application in in cannabis yeah i can see there are many opportunities in this field right because yes then everything is new so exactly that's why you know sometimes you have to conduct some very basic research because we are creating reliable information for for this plant that was pretty much i would say putting the back burn for 80 years at least. So in your research, how do you incorporate digital agriculture into all of the studies that you do? Okay, well, talking again about the cannabis term, so uh, so as the cannabis gen genus, so the production of cannabinoid is, is a different, uh, again, it's one, it seems like I'm just working with, with one plant, but basically I'm working with three totally different plants. Because when you're working with cannabinoid production, let's say THC, it's indoors, it's controlling environment agriculture. When you're working for CBD production, or you know, it can be more like like a like a horticulture management, you know, plastic beds, drip irrigation, 
this this type of management. And then when we work with fiber and grain production, then it's more like a like a row crops, you know, wheat and soybean production. So it's one plant, but three totally different uh, uh, management. So then the question, then then it will depend what you're producing. Obviously, if you're producing uh, THC, let's say THC or or cannabinoids, so it will be technology that are more adaptable for controlling environment agriculture, which is highly, like intensively. Technolo technological, you know, applied, you know, uh, all, you know, the sensors, you know, um, uh, artificial light, um, um, hydroponics. So uh, for horticulture management, I would, it's, it would be more field, you know, digital uh, ag field application. You know, you can use, you know, satellite images, you know, drones, uh, more comparable to what you can use for like row crops. That would be also applicable for uh, the production of uh, fiber and, and grain uh, cannabis. Yeah, this is really cool. And Jose, uh, we saw in your YouTube channel that you talk about the importance of the moisture um, in the production. So do you know if that is a specific digital tool or softwares or some app that can be used to measure the moisture? Or if not, do you think that is something already in the market that could be used? Oh, uh, I'm surprised that you checked my YouTube channel. I, I, it's, I mean, it's a long time I don't update that channel. I need to be more, you know, active you know, on my YouTube channel. Uh, but yeah, I mean... Well, it, it, I mean, it, we then it goes back again for the like, what are you producing? Like, if you're producing cannabinoids, so um, it's more indoors. So and or even more horticulture um, uh, settings. So drip irrigation. So when you're working with you know indoor cultivation or like hydroponics, let's say, uh, of course, it's it's always important. To keep up with your, you know, moisture levels, uh, and you know there are many tools that you can use to uh, to uh, to to have the moisture levels uh, uh, information, like in uh, I would say every second, pretty much. And then for for fiber and grain production, then you can use you know the, the soil moisture sensors that you know are applicable for for row crops, you know. Um, yeah, I, 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 I uh, during my, my master degree at Auburn, we actually, I test like a new, it was a new technology back then, but it was like a wireless soil moisture sensors that you install in, you know, in rep rep I mean, I, I'm pretty sure you guys know that, rep representative areas of the field and the, the sensors send like a wireless information to the cell phone towers and then the cell phone towers spread the data to the, the, the producers. So this type of, uh, uh, of uh, technology is something that is more applicable for uh, fiber and grain production, but not much for you know, cannabinoid production. And also, as you mentioned, some apps. Today, I was actually playing with that. There is a, app, a really cool app called GrowDoc. And it's pretty much an AI, like a visual, uh, like a vision tool, tool that is caught and diagnoses uh, cannabis uh, disease and some cultivation problems. So, um, you know, I guess, you know, the AI reads the image and then can tell you what type of disease is going on with that specific plant. Uh, and then, it, then it's a tool that can be used for indoor and outdoor production. But I'm seeing that this app being used, used more like indoors. That's pretty cool. Um, do you think there's any gaps or room for improvement in current ca cannabis production that sensors or digital tools could help with? So you mean like yield gap, like production gap? Uh, yield gap, like knowledge gaps, any sort of. Uh, yeah, as I said, we do have this 80 years 
knowledge gap that like based you know on science that you know that since the prohibition started it's you know it was created and now we we're trying to catch up but the other thing i would say uh, in like yield gap i know i guess you know being the middle west you know we have farmers like let's say corn farmers or soybean farmers that you know they're literally competing each other the neighbors like ha huh, what you know how much was your yield this past growing season and so they're like literally competing each other but for cannabis as i would say of course it's developing quickly but the genetics of like the seeds or the 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 cultivars are not as developed as you know corn and, and soybean so then when you ask like yield gap like what is the yield gap like how much records or how much data you have uh, about that specific cultivar that it can tell me with confidence that I'm not reaching the the genetic potential of that plant, you know? So that's why it's it, it, everything is very new. So, so there are a lot of gaps <laughs> in general. Yeah. Yeah, as we mentioned, there are many opportunities in this field. We can for see. sure, for sure. And if if there is an like for example a listen a listener here and they want to start to produce cannabis, uh, what would be the most important thing to be considered uh, in the cannabis production, in your opinion? Um, I guess first step is get your grower's license because uh in industrial hemp or low THC cannabis, lower than 0.3% THC cannabis, it's federally legal. So you can grow anywhere in America, in you know, 50 states. So, but you still need your grower's license in order to, to grow industrial hemp or low THC cannabis. So, um, so yeah, get your lower uh, grower's uh, license and try to get information about you know cultivating this plant like what is your purpose what is what is what is, is your goal is fiber fiber uh, and grain production or dual dual purpose uh, production it's cannabinoid production because as i said there are totally diff there are totally uh, different management uh, for for depending on what you're producing so and i guess another advice would be i mean i guess it's, this is not happening anymore it happens a lot in 2018 when the the 2018 farm bill were like signed and industrial hemp low thc plants were federally legal uh so I would say decrease your expectations. I mean, again, it's not happening anymore. It happened back then in 2018 when all the growers were like, oh, now I can grow cannabis. I will be a, a millionaire. So, you know, and it's like, as you call it, like back then it was like the green gold, everyone. And then you have this overproduction. We didn't have enough uh, extraction facilities or facilities to process their production. And so... But now, you know, I would say that the market or the cannabis production, depending on what you're producing, is, is, is stabilizing, I would say. Nice. Uh, yep. <laughs> okay, so moving to the uh, ne next questions. Ne next question, sorry. Uh, how do you think your current research could help with hemp and cannabis producers well i mean i guess that's that's an easy question because there is there are so many as we talk there are so many gaps that need to be filled like any information it's valid it's something you know it's better i would say better than nothing because you know uh it's i mean it's different than you know when you work with uh, uh again corn and soybeans that like like, like let's in the, in the middle west Every single county uh, has like a fertilizer recommendation for like corn or or, or soybean, but in, in for cannabis, <laughs> we don't have a 
a, a, like a, a, a cannabis uh, fertilizer recommendation, like, uh, you know, it's in general, you know, we're still working on it. Because again, depending on what you're producing, if it's cannabinoid production or, you know, it's indoors and or outdoors and like for pr production of fiber and grain. So, uh, so I guess my research group is trying to, you know, you know, create reliable information to to validate this empirical data that we have so far, especially you know for especially for cannab uh, cannabinoid production, uh, not much for fiber and grain, but but for fiber and grain you just don't have much information at all, you know, in America, uh, Eastern Eastern Europe. They do have, you know, more work. That's why a lot of the seeds, like for like grain and, and fiber, it comes from Eastern Europe and China. Uh, uh, but in America, we still, you know, developing, creating reliable information to fill up this, this gap. Yeah. And one of your focus for your research is about disease as well, right? I mean, well, I mean, I'm not a plant pathologist or not even an entomologist. I do have great colleagues that they're working with uh, entomology and you know, plant pathology. But I guess the, the, the study that you're talking about, it's because we are, we are testing methyl jasmonate on, on cannabis uh, production in general. Uh, plant developing, like biomass production, and cannabinoid uh, concentration. And we start seeing that the treatments receiving methyl jasmonate were being, uh, were, were having more uh, her, 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 herbivore attack. So then when you start seeing that the plants, uh, you know, under, you know, methyl jasmonate treatment are, were more damaged, uh, we, we add this parameter or like a disease assessment in that study because we want we we are like uh, trying to uh, to to um, evaluate if this you know if the application of methyl jasmonate, which is a plant hormone, uh, release when the plants needs to be like are in the, like a defense defense protection mode uh, or protection mode and uh, uh, would be correlated to herbivore attack. So we're still working in the data. Uh, but yeah, that's why, um, but also, you know, be, uh, working with, you know, cannabis in general, as cannabis is a plant just being introduced in the ecosystem, like just a new, a new plant that wasn't there anymore. It wasn't there, you know, before. And then you know, these pathogens are like, oh, what is this plant or this, you know, uh, insects are like, oh, let me try this plant. So, so cannabis is being a target of uh, like many, you know, different disease and pests for, you know, being like a, a, a new plant being introduced in the, you know, in the ecosystem. So even though I'm not a plant pathologist, we need to work with that too. Yeah. Um, what are you most looking forward to in the future of integrating digital tools with specialty crop production, specifically looking at cannabis? Um, I guess, I guess the romantic answer would be, oh, my research is a, a more applicable commercially. You know, my, my, the producers will be actually doing or what I'm telling them to do or what I'm I'm. I'm showing that is a more sustainable or more efficient way to do. That would be the romantic answer, I would say. But, 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 uh, but, but honestly, I think even the, like again, as we we're talking about terms, the digital ag term it's kind of always inter interchanged with precision ag or smart farming, right? So. Um, and and then under the you know this all this term like control environment agriculture so i guess it's a field that is being developed and i i would say the goal is to make this 
technologies more accessible for for the general grower and and then and then, and I guess you know developing this technology it's that's the way you know it's it's these sensors and all this technology dig, digital technology are going to become more accessible for the the regular grower and and then we have we create another problem because then they need to learn how to interpret all this data that they are you know getting so because because yeah it's really cool to have this all this data but how you interpret the data it's even more important because if you're not interpreting it in the right way it's useless so but but yeah but i think you know it's a, it's a, it's a it's a slow process i mean technology is developing quickly but uh but to educate the regular grower it's a slower process but i mean but that's why we are here right <laughs> yes exactly and yeah. it's not just giving the the numbers uh, for farmers, we need to help them as well to understand what those numbers mean. So, yeah, exactly. Like I remember during my P, uh, my master degree, as I work with precision ag, I work with some drones. And back then, like in 2014, some farmers were like, "Oh, you know, I'm never gonna buy a drone." But now, you know, I'm seeing a lot of farmers and you know, playing with the drones and you know actually taking advantage of this technology. So, uh. So I guess it's as technology is becoming more accessible, it's the next step would be educate the farmers for them to take the advantage of this technology in the right way, you know? Yes, that is yeah. true. I know I just finally convinced my dad to buy a drone for our farm. <laughs> oh, really? How, so he accept that or he's, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, I told him that he could get some cool pictures of harvest <laughs> and that was enough to persuade him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, it was a good, you know, start, I would say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is cool. Yeah. So is there anything that we didn't talk today that you think it might be important to cover or you want to add something? Uh, well, I guess, you know, um, as a big part of my job is controlling environment agriculture. And now is controlling environment agriculture is like a hot topic, you know, because, you know, Controlling environment agriculture, uh, urban farmer, uh, over, over, urban farming, um, vertical farming. You know, it's like we're trying to kind of decrease the the carbon uh, emissions, like growing plants closer to the the to ur urban areas. So, and 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 definitely, it's controlling environment agriculture is not the uh, it's under the umbrella of digital farming or digital ag so again these terms are you know interchanged all the time but um but yeah i think you know um working with cannabis i'm seeing a lot of people coming from like let's say chicago area as i'm in illinois without any farming background and but they are enthusiastic about cannabis and they want to learn how to grow cannabis so it's bringing you know city people literally city kids that never went to like a farm and now they're enrolling you know in a, you know the ag department in agronomy or horticulture because you know they want they are enthusiastic about cannabis so i, I like i like to use the the that cannabis is a, a um, gateway plant for science you know or for for academia because yeah it's and then, and, and, and actually I'm seeing that. And then some students, they enroll in, in horticulture or ag, and they're, they're interested to go to grad school. And students that never thought about going to grad school, but they're enthusiastic about the plant. And then, you know, and then they can change, you know, directions later and they work with a totally different plant. So I think that's, you know, it's, it's, in, it's important to, to, to be mentioned because in, I, I would say, Controlling environment agriculture is getting closer to this urban area and is getting closer to people that never thought about uh, working in agriculture, but now it's a way to them to work with uh, agriculture. And I guess another point is 
I'm not here to make any, you know, propaganda about cannabis or the use of, you know, high cannabinoid cannabis. What I'm here is to educate and fight for the right, the, the right to study this plant. Because, I mean, studying this plant, you know, conducting experiments, it's a way to find in a reliable way the positive things about this plant and the negative things. So, uh, so yeah, I think, you know, again, I'm not cre making any propaganda about the use of anything. It's just, we just want to address this plant as any other plant scientifically. Yep. Um, if our listeners have any more questions, uh, where can they go to uh, find more information? Um, oh, I guess it's a good opportunity for me to advertise my program though. <laughs> so, uh, well, I mean, I do have uh, like a um, website. It's www.drleme.com where, I mean, again, I have to update that website. Uh, but I, mo the most important information is there, like my email and my other social media. So, and I'm, uh, and my, also my, my, my Instagram uh, is uh, doc.leme. I try to be active in social media. I mean, it's, again, it's not anything fancy or it's just pretty much, you know, like a selfie. We are out here transplanting or cannabis clones or we are testing, you know, some new tissue culture techniques. So just to keep, you know, people updated about what I'm doing. Uh, and my 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 uh, team is uh, is doing so. Um, yeah, I guess you know, and also my you know university uh, page that you know if you type my name you can find. So yeah, I think those are good source uh, ways to find me. Great, and Jose, uh, a tradition on the Farm Beats podcast is to ask for a piece of advice. So do you, what advice do you have to anyone interested in getting into specialty crop research? For example, cannabis research. Oh, piece of advice. Pay your tax. <laughs> Eat healthy. I mean, just kidding. But well, I would say, um, well, cannabis is a very challenging uh, field. When I say that, it's, you know, like in terms of, you know, the, the, the cultivation requirements, because, you know, like, you know, you're working with a, a photoperiodic sensitive plant. So you're working with like, like if you're producing cannabinoids, you're, you know, you're working with feminized seeds, uh, you know, pollinization restriction. When you're producing cannabin uh, cannabinoid, you don't want plants to be pollinized. So everything that I learned in my agronomy courses that, you know, you want plants to be pollinized to produce seed for cannabinoid product is the opposite. So, and even also the regulation part, it's, it's challenging, you know, because all these restrictions, you know, but as you have to follow a very high um, management uh, standards, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's good to be that these standards are being uh, used, like these high standards, are being used for other crops too. So it's pretty much increasing the, the standards for many food crops. So, so, so yeah, if you wanna be, you know, in this, you know, cannabis industry in January, uh, be prepared for some challenges and, you know, but have some open minds that, you know, that information is being created and, and be, you know, and also open, I think open communication is also very important. Be in contact with, you know, your extension uh, agent, be in contact with some professors that are working in this, in this field. And, and, and again, I guess like things are getting more, uh, I, things are developing. So this cannabis or, or industrial hemp programs are being created in many different universities. So information is being more accessible for the general public. So, so yeah, I think, you know, 
be but be be prepared that I, I mean agriculture in general is you know it's a uh, intense work so but be be prepared that for cannabis it's even I would say it's even more work in in terms of like cultivation itself but also uh paperwork bureaucracy so and i know that farmers hate that you know all this bureaucracy and you know reports that you have to write so yeah so be prepared for that Thank you very much to José for taking the time to join this episode of the Farm Beats podcast. It's really exciting to hear about new research, especially in the cannabis field. One of my favorite parts of this episode was when José mentioned how versatile industrial hemp is. I agree, but my favorite part of this episode was some of the challenges and gaps that José mentioned. I hope you enjoyed that episode and we look forward to sharing another digital ag story with you next week on Farm Beats. Thank you for taking the time to join us today on the Farm Beats podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts to be informed about the latest content each week. We welcome your feedback. So if you have comments or questions for us, please reach out to us over email, on Twitter, or in the review sections of your favorite podcast platforms. Our contact information can be found in the show notes. We would like to thank you, Nebraska Extension, for their support of this podcast and their commitment to providing high-quality informational material to members of the agricultural community in Nebraska and beyond. The opinions expressed by the hosts and guests on this podcast are solely their own and do not reflect the views of Nebraska Extension or the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. We look forward to you joining us next week for another episode of Candidates.